Hello, ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, and dudes of all teenagers, as well as the uh, gals. My name is Christian Chandler. I am here, and y'all are there. Christian. Arguably the most documented person in history. His antics have been witnessed by millions with many always keeping a close eye on him, waiting to see what he does next. So he did was make me feel sad, depressed. He should love his mother. She misses him. Hello, we're live on the internet. What do you want? Hi, Mom, hello. I love the women outside. Do not hate. Hate is not so good. Christopher Weston Chandler was born on February 24, 1982, in Charlottesville, Virginia, to parents Bob, aged 54, and Barbara, 40. Bob had worked in the engineering field for Western Electric and later General Electric. The family held Bob's life accomplishments very proudly, as he had at least seven patents to his name, including mechanisms used in the production of Kleenex and molding of plastic water containers. Bob was very world-conscious and was an avid collector of stamps since a very young age. Later in life, he developed a love for music, especially foreign music. He eventually amassed a collection of over 10,000 vinyl records. He had a son and daughter from a previous marriage, the relationships with whom were strained to say the least. Barbara was the secretary with Virginia Power. She had a habit of hoarding her belongings and was an emotionally abusive person, which convinced her then 17-year-old son, Cole Smithy, to seek independence and live life on his own. So when Chris came along, Bob and Barb got a chance to start anew. The new family started their new life in their humble Ruckersville home. Chris later claimed that at around two months of age, he uttered his first word, monkey. It didn't take long for the parents to see that Chris wasn't quite like most other babies. The first signs of his autism could be witnessed in 1983. Despite his condition being congenital, he had stated that his autism was brought about by one particularly traumatic event when he was 18 months old. A babysitter named Roach, or Roach, would look after baby Christopher whenever his parents would go out in the evenings. One of these nights, Chris inadvertently infuriated her, and she locked him in a room filled with toys, in the dark, alone. This would prove so traumatic that he refused to speak for the next six years. Even though he sees this event as the source of all his troubles, he does not blame his parents for keeping Roach as his babysitter, for they did not know better. Despite living out his childhood as a mute, Chris was anything but quiet. He confessed later on in life that he screeched often and was very troublesome to his parents. In 1985, the Hammer household moved into the neighborhood. The Hammers and the Chandlers struck up a cordial relationship, which led to Chris forming a bond with the Hammers' daughter, Sarah. Looking back, 
Chris considered her to be his closest childhood friend and that she greatly helped him with his autism. However, from what is known of their relationship, it is also likely that she took advantage of Chris's innocence and trust and may be seen more as a bully than a friend. For example, she once told him that Casper the Friendly Ghost was hiding under her house. Naturally, Chris crawled into the hammer's crawl space to find him, only to find spiderwebs, bugs, and dirt instead. Sarah locked him in. After about half an hour, her dad came to his rescue. On another occasion, she told Chris that if he were to eat the upper thing of a honeysuckle, it would taste like honey. This is a reference to the berries of a honeysuckle, which can be slightly harmful if ingested in large doses. Fortunately, their parents told them of the dangers of doing so before Christopher could fulfill Sarah's wish. At the age of five, Chris began studying at Greene County Primary School together with Sarah. It is not known how he was treated here or how he got along with the other kids. In addition to taking regular classes at the primary school, he received language training at James Madison University. In 1987, in a lengthy letter addressed to Chris dated December 26th, Bob offered his outlook on life and presented some life advice for his son. There are many sides to a mountain and many ways to climb it. If you get stopped, back off, regroup, and try another way. If you are still not successful, maybe it is not meant to be. If it is meant to be, having it on the back burner simmering for a while is not bad. It will pop up again, and the way to attain it will be there. Everything in its time. Your mother and I have done our best for you, and in return, we expect at least that from you, for yourself and your children. He also expressed wishes for his son to inherit and hold dearly his vast collection of music, movies, stamps, and art prints. He reminisced about the straight razor which he inherited from his grandfather, which he carelessly broke while using it as a screwdriver. Bob still held on to that broken razor his entire life because his grandfather wanted him to have it. Bob hoped that Chris would share his father's sentiment. I hope that you will not carelessly misuse, waste, or destroy the value of the many things I have collected for you. First, learn all about them, how to use them and enjoy them, their value, and how you can thoughtlessly waste their value. Then enjoy them as I have. For example, my very good stamp collection, or all the recorded popular music on cassette tape, VCR tapes, and records, my books on popular music, movies, entertainers, musical theater, ship models, my daylilies, gazebo, and dreams. This letter offers an insight into Bob's character as he feared that all he had accomplished over the course of his life may be lost. In 1989, during a weekly trip to the toy store with his mother, Chris picked up a GoBot up on display and slowly started to read out the text on the package, ending his six years of silence. Later that same year, Bob and Chris converted the shed in their backyard into a workshop, christening it the Dreaming Studio. Bob had hoped that he and his son would build things together there. He even commemorated the space with a plaque, Dreaming Studio of Mr. C and Lil C, where dreams do come true. However, when asked about it, Chris could not recall what, if anything, had been built there. It was instead mostly used by Barbara for storage. For Christmas of that year, he got a Nintendo Game Boy. This was also the year that the family got Patty Chandler, a Beagle Spitz mix, which they picked up as a pup from their Aunt Karina. Chris grew very attached to the dog, displaying a fondness and arguably a love rarely shown for anything or anyone else in his life. In 1990, Bob co-hosted a jazz marathon on WTJU Radio. During the program, he displayed his keen knowledge on 20s and 30s jazz music. Okay, now we go on to performance number two, which is tight like that. This is November the 9th, 1928, with Chicago personnel, Tampa Red's Hokum Jug Band. There's a great group of Chicago musicians featuring kazoo, guitar, and jug by Hudson Whitaker. Tampa Red's guitar, Thomas A. Dorsey is on the piano and the washboard. Frankie Halfpipe Jackson. Vocals interact to make this a great session. Listen for some very good kazoo and jugs, and notice how half pint Jackson laughs like scat singing. Very unusual. <laughs> In 
1990 also marked the last year of Chris's tenure at Greene County Primary School. For his fourth grade studies, he transferred to Nathaniel Green Elementary School. It was here where he allegedly had very distressing experiences. He asserts that the staff at the school didn't know how to handle autistic children and treated him cruelly. Chris contends that five members of staff abused him by pinning him down to the ground, holding his wrists and ankles, and audio taping his cries. Furthermore, he claimed that the principal forced him to sit on his lap and said offensive things to him, but little Christopher resisted and the advances never went further than that. The principal is also claimed to be gay, which Chris feels justifies his homophobia. I was abused by one, a homosexual principal at my elementary school slapped me on his lap, said some offensive things to me, and I felt uncomfortable. Even though Chris's accounts of the events could not be verified, it is also not unlikely that an event like this could have taken place. Though Chris never specified the reasoning behind their attacks, nor did he state whether him being restrained and being assaulted by the principal were separate or related events, it is possible that he may have been restrained and verbally abused as a form of disciplinary action and even placed in a scream room, which was a fairly common school installation for dealing with autistic children up until the mid-1990s. Whatever event transpired, it forced Chris's parents to take him away from Nathaniel Green Elementary School. To further things, they took the case to Green County Court. After the school board threatened to take Chris out of mainstream education and instate him into a special needs school, the Chandlers dropped the case. For the remainder of the school year, he was homeschooled. It was around this tumultuous time that young Christopher had an uplifting experience that would change his life. During a shopping trip in Richmond, possibly in December 1992, but in other accounts he stated that it was 1989, he came across the Leonard Bernstein Symphony Orchestra, a show comprised of animatronic characters that is held around Christmas time at the Regency Square shopping mall. The conductor, Leonard Bernstein, is made to be fully interactive with his audience with the help of a human controller behind the scenes. On this blessed day, the turnout for the show was weak, so Chris got extra attention from the bear. When Leonard asked him his name, the person controlling the animatronic misheard it and answered back, calling him Christian. The boy took this as a profound sign and felt that he should be called Christian. In order for Chris to continue with formal education, Bob and Chris moved to Chesterfield County while Barbara remained in the family house in Rockersville with Patty so she could keep working. Christian enrolled in Providence Middle School in Richmond. He looked back fondly over his time here, giving special credit to his teacher Virginia Sanford. She was the most influential teacher in my life. During my years at Providence Middle School, she taught me better social skills how to better cope with other people, bullies, and life. With a positive and fun tomboyish attitude, she was a teacher any child would be most proud to look up to and be taught by. He also forged a friendship with Natasha Turner, a girl a few years older than him. He lost romantic interest in her when he saw her smoking. They would often hang out together at the bus stop. He would sometimes give her money on behalf of his father for her friendship and attention. Chris would later realize that Natasha was, in a sense, a friend with benefits. She would stay with him and be friendly in exchange for a monetary reward from Bob. Bob knew that his son had little hope in forming true friendships otherwise. The Avengers, the Sonic the Hedgehog, the cool new TV show is on the air. In the fall of 93, Sega, the video game developer, held a watch and win sweepstakes contest in conjunction with their Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon. The lucky winner would get a $1,000 shopping spree at KB Toys. And that winner was Chris. Christian is one of only about 100 winners nationally to receive $1,000 worth of Sega games and equipment. For his parents, it's just another example of how well he's doing. Christian is a high-functioning autistic child. This past fall, on his own initiative, he entered a contest based on a favorite cartoon character. It had to do with exactly what Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon and I'd listen to what Sonic says at the end of it and write it down for a whole week and then I had to mail it in and I had to be drawn out of a hat and I just won. 
And Christian's father says it only takes a few hours for him to master an electronic game and then move on to another. I can't master any of them. That's it for now. And it's this is the first of many competitions that he entered during his life and has cemented itself as a likely key reinforcer to his future sense of entitlement. On December 29, 1993, the Richmond Times Dispatch published an article about Christian's magical encounter with Leonard Bearstein, entitled, It Took a Talking Bear to Give the Name a Young Boy Loves. The boy's father recounts the events of the day. Since this was early in the Christmas season, on a Thursday afternoon, the crowd was light. The conversation between Leonard and Christopher lasted about an hour. Christopher was spellbound. Something unusual happened during that conversation. When Leonard Bearstein, in a decidedly British accent, asked Christopher his name, the bear must have misunderstood what the boy replied. Leonard started calling our son Christian. What better name for the Christmas season? And the name stuck like glue. From that time on, for the past year, his name has been Christian Weston Chandler. Christian is very emphatic about that. Bob also offered up some insight into the family's situation. Christopher is a high-functioning autistic child. While intellectually, his age level is 12 or 13, socially, he is around age 7 or 8. He has some behavior problems with his peers and relates better with children a few years younger than him. The Green County school system was not equipped to teach an autistic child, Mr. Chandler said. The Chesterfield County school system has accepted him with open arms. The article also mentions that Bob had originally wanted to name his son Christian, but had chickened out. It is unclear what scared him off from naming his child Christian. In any case, the following year, the boy had his name legally changed to Christian Weston Chandler. In the spring of 96, Barbara retired from her secretarial position at Virginia Power and moved in with Bob and Chris, reuniting the boy with Patty the dog. In late spring, Chris graduated from Providence Middle School. As a parting gift, Mrs. Sanford wrote a personal, touching, and prophetic letter to Chris. Well, it's been three years now at Providence, and it's all over. Where has the time gone to? The most important parting words I can leave you with, well, are to always remember this. You show people where your weak points are located, then they will know how to push your button. If you never show them, they will never know. I hope you will have an enjoyable summer and come back to visit. Do your very best at Manchester, put your best foot forward, and treat others as you wish to be treated. Love, Mrs. Sanford. The Manchester in question happened to be Manchester High School, where, according to Christian, he spent the happiest years of his life. Over the course of four semesters, he studied Spanish, of which he has a very loose grasp. For class assignments, he adopted a Spanish name, Ricardo, a common practice for students in order to better get into character and the culture of the language. However, Christian got too into character and often used Ricardo in class assignments outside of Spanish and even considers it as part of his real name. When riding on the school bus, he used to sit right in front of the bus door so he could always get off the fastest. However, during his freshman year, he got into an altercation with another boy who wanted to be off the bus first. He punched Christian in the face, knocking his glasses off. In order to resolve the issue, Chris was forced to take the special ed bus to school from then on, which deeply affected him. He always felt very uncomfortable associating with others whom he called slow in the minds. I ended up with this really worse off mentally challenged person who could hardly ever speak other than err. That boy bopped me on the back of the head for his own laughs. The special ed teacher who rode on the bus talked with his brother about it, and he kept him from bopping me. But having to put up with his nonsensical slur talk was still just as cringy and horrifying. Ugh. Among his other activities, he served as a water boy and allegedly a manager for the school basketball team, the Manchester Lancers, along with Joseph Herring, one of Christian's only male friends. Chris had always gravitated towards girls, and at Manchester, this was no exception. He had a sizable group of female friends, which he dubbed Gal Pals. Among the first that he met was Molly Quarles, a cheerleader at the time whom he met as a freshman. 
he fondly remembered them being paired up during a matchup event for Valentine's Day. Laura Beth Dorazio was another cheerleader Chris met and fell for, but after he confessed that he had a crush on her, she told him that she would like them to remain just as friends. Tiffany Gowan was said to be a real good girl to Chris, and he has described her as a bit of a tomboy and a peppermint patty to his Charlie Brown. Kelly Andes was his biggest crush and says they were high school sweethearts, even though they were never in an actual relationship together. Sarah Bevel was in the same chemistry class along with Kelly and Chris. Sarah had a boyfriend at the time and Chris watched them interact, hoping to experience that kind of relationship one day. It was fun to just watch them flirt with each other. I could have learned from that, but my autism and normal social phobias held me back then. Miranda Mitchell was the big brain in his circle of friends and shared computer graphics class with Christian. His group of gal pals were possibly not genuinely interested in a friendship with Chris, but rather stayed with him out of pity or as protection. A later comment made by Chris suggests that the group had made an arrangement with Bob and or the principal of the high school. Concerning schoolwork, there is a wealth of information that has been attained which helps to refute his previous claims that he held an honor roll streak all throughout high school. For one of his assignments, he had to conduct an interview with his parents, offering some more information about their life experiences. For the question, why did you choose to have children, they answered, it's nice to have kids. For what adjustments did you have to make after your first child arrived, they answered, laughter from four kids and three situations, referring to the troubled past marriages and estranged children. Interestingly, when asked about what has been the hardest part about parenting, the answer was, dealing with the school system. In another assignment concerning families, Chris inserted mathematical equations into his definitions, making them hard to read and understand. For example, he defined a nuclear family as a mother, father, and X is more than or equal to one child sharing the same household. He also described adoption as a right to raise a child who is biologically their own. Christian took part in a parenting exercise in which he wore an empathy belly to simulate the feeling of being a pregnant woman. He wrote a report describing his experience. Having a belly like a pregnant woman was really an awkward experience. When I tried to get my pencil bag out of my backpack, the belly held me back by putting pressure on my left leg. Luckily my arms were long, but if they were any shorter, I would have had a real problem to reach the pencil bag. While I was sitting in my chair, the belly made it uncomfortable for me to cross my legs, and while my legs were separated, it put pressure on my private part, which gave me a strange, weird feeling. He wrote an essay about Japan's involvement in World War II. It should be noted that he addressed himself as Ricardo W. Chandler, with Christian placed in parentheses, and wrote English in Spanish. The teacher justly corrected this. According to Chris, the war was a very tragic event, with guns, insults, and yuck. He continues, The Japanese and Americans had deemed glowering at each other like boxers from opposite corners of a 5,000 mile ring, waiting for the bout to begin. So, the US and Japan really wanted to get it on. He also quoted that President Woodrow Wilson tried to get Japan to withdraw from Shandong. Christian's essay ended up being a mishmash of events of both world wars. In addition, he referenced several books, however all of his findings could be found within the first eight pages. The teacher commented, Restate Thesis. There is a page titled Warm Fuzzies for Christian W. Chandler, which most likely was a class activity in which the students wrote nice things to each other in order to promote acceptance. The messages left for Chris read very bland, such as, I like your clothes, is a very funny and nice person, okay funny, you are a nice person, nice watch, you tell great jokes, and you tell fun jokes. But perhaps the most baffling piece of writing that there is on record is his 13 lucky writing tips, an assignment for English class in which he switches four tips in to what most closely resembles Spanish. In any case, it is little more than unintelligible garble. Use standard written English. Do not use contractions in formal writing. You must have a thesis statement in each essay. 
the thesis statement as el final de estancia de introductory paragrafe. Tu escribes de literatura. El thesis inclure el llama de author y llama de work. Los paragraphs supporte y relate cue el thesis. Los paragraphs tienes el topic estances hablan el unifying concepto de el paragraph. Los details support y relate a el topic estance de paragraph. Necesitas los adecuate soporte details. Escribe el literatore en presente tense. Necesitas tres muchaco mirar de puente. Necesitas creas muy bien tu escribes creas sense y es muy logical. Cheques tu escribir muy carefully. From the school report, it can be seen that he failed all but two of his 14 assignments, earning a D plus for the year. At age 16, Chris wrote a poem entitled Song of Christian for his class, loosely based on Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. He decided to record his creation for posterity in video form. The video itself is poorly lit, but there isn't much to see anyway. I hear America singing as I sing of myself, and you experience as I experience. The problems of yourself are my problems. The youth of the young singing cries a happiness. The children's song is song of laughter. At age six weeks, I sang this song of laughter. That at one and a half years of age, the Lord put the mute button on me. My song that I sing, although I talk well, my peer relationship is low and my loneliness is off the scale. Anyway, that's my poem. Beyond just reciting the poem, he pretends to be the enthusiastic host of the Christian Chandler Show. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Christian Chandler Show. We get lots of laughs and all that neat old stuff. Now here he is, the host of the most Christian Chandler. Good evening, friends, and welcome to the Christian Chandler Show. I am your host, Christian Chandler. He then rambles on about his fascination with the Sonic the Hedgehog universe and talks about Bionic the Hedgehog, his first Sonic-related creation, which he came up with during basketball practice. And then I have science friend that helps, of course, tails that flies, knuckles he punches and climbs, and Bionic, well, you heard rumors about Bionic. He's that science brother I met myself who's that very good basketball player and mechanic. And I can tell you the background story on him. He proceeds to rant about receiving an F in English class. I see by the clock, that's about time I sign off. But uh, before I go, I just one thing to say to uh, the teacher. An F in English class? You have got to be kidding me. I mean an F. I do not even know what was the last time I got an F. I mean, who knows? It could have been back in old Green County. That stupid place. Fish. At Green County Primary. Actually, it was a nice school, but then it came to Fayette Green Elementary. That's probably where I got the F. Anyway, they made years go by. And you came along and gave me a nap. I am going to start off with a name, and you just lowered it, lowered it, lowered it. I'm getting sick and tired of this lower thing. What do you have against all... I guess the handicapped children anyway. I mean, I know my handicap is autism, and I'm not afraid to admit it. And you, Mrs. Bird, I think that F is very disrespectful. I mean, I am very emotional about it. Anyway, it's time I sign off. Well, this has been the Christian Channel Show. Around the same time, he made a series of stop-motion videos of races set in his Lego-made town called Quickville, based on his own initials. They were made with a Game Boy camera, which produced grainy, low-resolution grayscale photos, or, alternatively, low-quality stop-motion video. The awkward frame rate makes it difficult to discern what is actually going on, but it is important to note that all the racers are named either after pop culture characters that Christian idolized, or people he knew in real life. This is the earliest account of Chris using people to play out his fantasies. The biggest trend in kids' toy history, it's multi-multi-billion dollar. Throughout the late 1990s, the Pokemon franchise was spreading across North America, with Chris keeping a keen eye on it. He began playing the trading card game, 
and included illustrations of Pokemon characters in his Spanish homework. He also wrote a lengthy essay detailing how the Pokemon came into their Pokeballs, with which his teacher was very pleased. The year 1999 marked the birth of his Wall of Originals. This was a designated portion of the wall which displayed Pokemon trading cards that Chris made himself. It featured original Pokemon such as a female Pikachu called Chikachu and Plotistic, a plant which is autistic. Chris himself also appeared several times. His fascination grew to a point that he would dress up as the Pokemon character Ash Ketchum out in public. Around mid-1999, Christian launched his first website, a simple Pokemon-themed effort humbly called Quick's Pokesite, cementing the moniker Quick. It was soon replaced by Quick's Pokesite 2 with a new logo designed by Miranda. He updated it with personal and Pokemon-related news here semi-regularly for the next year and a half. This year also marked Christian's first visit to The Game Place, a game and hobby store which allowed returning customers to play video games, board games, or trading card games. It quickly became his weekly haunt. The Pokemon craze was captured on film for Richmond's NBC affiliates WWBT News. The report featured excited young kids playing the game and trying to explain the phenomenon. How do you play the game? I can't explain, it's too long. Their bewildered parents standing witness. Um, I'm watching and, and uh, I still have no clue. <laughs> and the 17 year old Chris in action. I'll switch, I'll put out my dragon air, even though I have 60 damage on it. Oh boy. And I have speed energy on it. Slam attack. So if you had the time to tell. To commemorate Valentine's Day of the year 2000, Christian wrote a Valentine's Day hymn a free verse effort in which he reveals that he holds very traditional views on courtship and the predetermined rules of etiquette for men and women. On a date, the man could not pay the bill, so his date slammed her door in his face. The man's coat over a puddle, the maiden walks, then the man trips and pays the laundry bill. Under the moonlight, the couples of the world kiss, but unfortunately for a few, they are interrupted by their parents. He uploaded it onto his website. Ten days later, Chris celebrated his 18th birthday, a date which he held in the highest regard. Among the guests in attendance were a handful of Christian's gal pals and his half-brother Cole. Nearly three years after the fact, he reminisced about the event. I will never forget my 18th birthday party. It was the best of the rest. The weekend before my real birthday, my mother and I prepared for the party I was going to host that day. We hung balloons and streamers, and we laid refreshments on the table. At the door was four of my high school amigas, and one of them brought a friend. We ate pepperoni pizza and drank Pepsi. It was great. As mother lit the candles, I was filling up with ecstasy. After I blew the candles, I was presented with a big jawbreaker from Kelly an R.L. Stein novel from Sarah, a planer with stickers from Miranda, and a rabbit doll with jelly beans from Tiffany. We watched Good Burger and had fun. After they left, it was done. What did I wish for? I'm not telling. Even though he seemed pleased that his gal pals came to celebrate, he was never pictured together with them, preferring to sit alone. He is also photographed wearing a pair of jeans with a suspicious stain on his crotch. Some have speculated that it is dried semen, but it is unlikely. About a month later, Chris was tasked with designing a CD jewel case for his graphic design class. On the fateful day on March 17, 2000, I wanted to feature on my favorite hit CD cover, Lifelong Hero, Sonic the Hedgehog, and cute newer character, Pikachu, but copyrighted characters were prohibited from the project. So, in my mind, I pondered and pondered, when it hit me visually, Sonic and Pikachu combined. In a way to escape copyright, he combined Sonic the Hedgehog and Pikachu to create Sonichu, the electric hedgehog Pokemon, which Christian considers to be one of his greatest life accomplishments. The CD tracklist itself consists of Pokemon, Sonic and Mario related music, with intermittent appearances of old time jazz from artists such as Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby undoubtedly an influence from his father. Another month later, 
Chris had to document a week of his life for a school project. The result was A Week with Christian W. Chandler, a self-documentary, which detailed the events of his life from April 29th to May 5th, 2000. The front cover features a blurry photo of Chris and Patty, with a discolored ghostly sonic below. He writes it in the third person, as if followed by a documentary crew. On April 29th, he visits Books A Million to participate in the Pokemon Trading Card Game League. Afterwards, he enters a costume contest, and since he wore his regular Ash Ketchum outfit, he wins and receives a cool t-shirt as a reward. The following day, he talks about packing and moving things from their home in Richmond to their old house in Rutgersville. The next day, he goes to high school. He uses a tripod to help take pictures of himself. During class, Mr. Goss discussed the difference between Shakespeare's world and the real world of today. Christian rested his eyes after Mr. Goss's discussion and before the bell rang. Next, he had trigonometry. I'd hate to be Christian when his nerves kicked into action after waking up from a naughty snooze cruise, but I was. Next was computer graphics. It was great for him today, because he got to print his own CD cover. Next was Spanish too. He took a quiz today, but I think he feels confident in his work. And finally, after a hard odd day, he rides home on a bus, but unfortunately, it had a few slow in the minds on it. The following day, he repeats the routine of snoozing through class, and that on even days, he eats lunch with Tiffany and Sarah. For the following day, he describes his daily activities at home, which mostly consist of playing video games and managing his website. The next day, he talks about working in computer graphics class and making a Mother of the Year award for Barbara, which he plans to give to her on Mother's Day. For the final day's report, Chris states that it was a difficult Friday. One of his duties included taking part in a senior group photo. After the long wait for the pictures to be taken, being crowded like a sardine surrounded by immature teenage boys, and having the hot, hot sun shining down on him and everyone else, he went back to the shady entrance. After the photo shoot, Chris was picked up by his dad. And that concludes our week-long documentary of A Week with Christian W. Chandler, the autistic boy that has made it this far. Colon close parentheses. Chris wouldn't pass up an opportunity to go to the senior prom, so he did, bringing his mother along as a date. Even though Christian had labeled the set of photos as the senior prom, it is possible that it was some other social gathering due to the fact that the event is held during the daytime. Looking back on the prom, he claimed that he was naive about dating unlike the other students. Out of pity or out of genuine compassion, Tiffany asked Christian to dance. I hesitated at first, but she grabbed my hand and pulled me onto the dance floor. We danced for what felt like hours. It was the most pleasant experience of that night and I thank her for dancing with me then. He felt that her willingness to dance with him meant that she was attracted to him, and stated that if they were to meet again, they would start a relationship. Graduation. The end of high school. The end of his interactions with his gal pals. Most importantly, it was the day Christian had to be recognized for his achievements. But unfortunately, this wasn't the case. I only got recognized for my grades with a star pin, yet they had more fancier awards for more important qualities. I should have been highly recognized for my artistic talents I showed in my many art classes for the award ceremonies before graduation day. I felt crestfallen greatly from not getting recognized for any of my talents. I excelled in math too for the love of God. I was so f jealous. I was a high-functioning autistic boy who came way beyond out of his social shell, only to get zilch, nada, zip, a big fat zero. I felt so devastated and out of sync. As a result of his heartbreak, he only went up on stage to receive his diploma without looking at anyone's face nor shaking anyone's hand. After the ceremony was over, he found himself at an unoccupied table, sat by it, and cried. Eventually, his mother and later Tiffany came to console him. His father would look back on this event with shame and anger for years to come. Christian's time at high school is still thought of fondly by him, 
recalling his sweet memories of creating artistic projects for class and frequently hanging out with his gal pals, all of which were abruptly ended with that gloomy, rainy graduation. But with the end of high school came the promise of a new world in college, a chance for new friends, new experiences, and the first steps to a brighter future. as fascinated. This is the story of Chris Chan. In the year 2000, the Chandlers came back to their family home in Rutgersville and in August, at the behest of his parents, Christian began attending Piedmont, Virginia Community College, where the highest level degree students could attain was an associate degree. Perhaps spellbound by illusions of grandeur, Chris chose to study marketing, but Bob quickly transferred him to a computer-aided drafting and design degree, in the hopes that it would be a better fit for his challenged son and his future. According to the PVCC handbook of the time, this was a two-year degree, worth 15 credits. In addition, he took English classes and even a tennis class. Apart from study, he continued to develop his Pokemon website and added more cards to his wall of originals, creating cards representing, among others, his beloved Sonichu. In October, he launched Quick's Sonichu site, a website devoted to his original character. Over the course of the year, the Sonichu family grew. He created Sonny, Sonichu's pre-evolutionary form, and dedicated a trading card to him. He also gave Sonichu a female companion, Rose Chu, based on Amy Rose from the Sonic franchise. After high school, contact with his gal pals was lost, apart from Kelly. He claimed to have called her every weekend for about a year. For Christmas of that year, Christian made her a CD entitled Songs for Kelly as his gift. He incorporated a mini Sonichu into the artwork. Winter of 2000 is also significant, for that was when Chris created his Sonichu medallion, made of Crayola model magic and acrylic paints. Late 2000, I bought some Crayola model magic clay, and I molded and crafted the first original Sonichu medallion that I wore around my neck, with a makeshift chain, which I later replaced with a better necklace I bought from Pacific Sunwear at my mall. He would rarely be seen without it. The following year, he continued to develop the lore around Sonichu, which included creating an offspring for Rose Chu called Rosie, and designing an Archie Comics cover for Sonic the Hedgehog vs. Sonichu. For his mother's 60th birthday, he made her a cake with Sonichu on it. In July, he filmed the City of Quickville tour using the stop motion feature on his Game Boy camera. The town in question was his yet unfinished Quickville made of Lego. He still hadn't settled on a naming system yet, so he spells it in two different ways. First with an I, then with an I and a K. The tour is led by a Lego incarnation of Christian, and he shows two landmarks of the town. The water tower and go-kart pass before the video abruptly ends, possibly due to the Game Boy camera only having the capacity to hold 30 frames at a time. In August, Christian got a job at Wendy's. He was mostly in charge of cleaning trays, tables, and carpet tile flooring, keeping the place neat and serving the customers with kind, understanding help. He alleges that he never quite saw eye to eye with a supervisor who disagreed with Chris's way of operating. According to one supposed event, he got his uniform dirty, and despite it being likely that he could have swapped with a clean spare at the establishment, he proceeded to continue to work with his sullied attire and even attempted to wash it in the bathroom sink. According to Christian, a female co-worker gave him a hard time, pelting him with criticisms and insults, perhaps mistaking her constructive criticisms for attacks against his person. He also admitted he took breaks frequently, neglecting other duties. 
Chris was fired from Wendy's in September or October 2001 for a number of possible reasons. One of the most popular motives for his dismissal was that he performed a Donald Duck impression to a child at the restaurant, bringing him to tears. In other accounts, he said that he was fired after he drew an unflattering caricature of an older female co-worker. His termination was likely a culmination of these events. It was also around this time that Chris ended his weekly calls to Kelly. He gave conflicting reasons for this. He first stated that he suffered from noviophobia, a term he coined, which he defines as a fear of speaking to a woman who may already be in a relationship, which convinced him that his calls were in vain. Initially, Chris stated that he was told by his mother that Kelly most likely already had a boyfriend, so he might as well quit his attempts. But later, he changed his story, saying that he came to that realization all by himself. In other retellings, he said that he simply forgot to call her one weekend, and after he broke the routine, he didn't want to continue. On February 24th, 2003, Christian spent a tearful 21st birthday. For some reason, he was kicked out of English class by his male and possibly gay professor. Like many historical accounts of his life, he keeps changing the story. First, he said that the class was reading the book Wednesday's Child, which featured an autistic girl. He recounted that he told the professor that he was autistic as well, which resulted in a misunderstanding and Chris being forced to leave the class. Alternatively, he admitted to causing a disruption in class, writing in a report exclamations you'd likely hear from a black person in church, which prompted his dismissal from the classroom. This ejection further increased his hate for men and gay men in general, and further convinced him of launching a pursuit to find true love. In order to meet whom he called a boyfriend-free girl, he launched his love quest. However, finding that one special person in his life wasn't going to be easy. Christian didn't feel like he had the confidence to approach women on his own volition, due to the infinitely high boyfriend factor. This term refers to the very high probability that any girl to whom he spoke already had a boyfriend, making it close to impossible to find his coveted boyfriend-free girl. By extension, every man who already had a girlfriend was thought of by Chris with seething loathing. With the infinitely high boyfriend factor, I'm not fond of about 99.9999999996% of the total male population, with a margin of error of the 4 billionth of a percent for about 100 men, of whom are okay acquaintances. Those doofs get all the luck, having a sweetheart to care for and to be cared from, getting all the hugs, kisses and e emotional support and the security of a solid future without loneliness and with love and children. And besides that, my autism is not much help on the programming of my mind. Sigh. Oh, my life. To combat his reluctance to approach prospective females, he devised a way in which women would approach him instead. The attraction sign. Christian created what he called an attraction sign, which was much like a personals ad, but in public. 21 and single white male, shy, smart, young at heart, computer skilled, humorous, a great thinker and go-getter, natural salesperson, enjoys good parts of life, diplomatic, friendly, loves his family, peaceful, very creative, he's lonely. Seeking a cute, 18 to 21 single, female companion, 18 to 21 years of age, does not already have a boyfriend. Single, average to slender weight, body type, white, lives in Charlottesville or Rutgersville area, does not smoke or drink alcohol, happy, positive personality, average high income, drives a vehicle. If any men read this huge sign, mind your own business. And to all men with girlfriends, except marrieds and blacks, go jump off a cliff. Have a nice day. He would hang the sign up at the PBCC lobby and would stand or sit beside it in the hopes of attracting potential mates. Based on the attraction sign and later comments, it is clear that instead of finding the love of his life, his quest for a sweetheart was more of a quest to lose his virginity and to find a woman to mother him and financially support him. Just a couple of months into his love quest, Christian was met with an obstacle. Mary Lee Walsh, the Dean of Student Affairs, tore down his attraction sign and allegedly even tore it up in front of him. According to Chris, 
She yelled at him in a violent manner and said that his way of doing things would not get him a girlfriend. It is likely that Walsh may have, in fact, taken down his sign and told him that it was inappropriate, as his methods were akin to soliciting sex on campus. In any case, he was deeply disheartened by this event. It literally shattered my heart to almost nothing and murdered my soul. In response to this attack, Christian made another sign, which was quickly removed in a similar fashion. This was to be the beginning of Christian's make-believe conflict with Mary Lee Walsh that will haunt him for most of his adult life. As an act of catharsis, Christian wrote a poem called Saddest Heart in the World, in which he refers to Walsh in the most unkind of light. Lonesome and sad, lonesome and sad, the mastermind is very bad. In efforts of getting a boyfriend-free gal, that female dog took my only idea for a fall. Heartbroken, sad and very lonely, I may never remove my virginity. On April 10th, Chris wrote a short story called Sonichu and Rose Chu, The Genesis of the Love Hogs. It establishes the origins of Sonichu and Rose Chu, and also incorporates elements from the Sonic the Hedgehog lore, such as the Chaos Emeralds. In addition, the story features a lovely Pokemon trainer. Her name was Kel, short for Kelly. He published it on his Sonichu site. In June, Christian found work as a salesperson for Cutco, a cutlery retailer. It is unknown whether he actually managed to sell any knives. Later testimonies prove that he was still in possession of unpurchased stock, holding onto some items more than a decade after he was employed. His tenure ended in August, when his boss left the Charlottesville area. In August, the newly formed band, Christian and the Hedgehog Boys, released their debut album. The band, which was led by Christian, and also featured Sonic, Sonichu, Shadow the Hedgehog, and Black Sonichu, in fact only existed in Christian's head. The album entirely consisted of Christian singing melody-free vocals with original lyrics over existing songs being played in the background. His songs covered a range of topics, such as his search for love in So Need a Cute Girl, based on I Want It That Way by the Backstreet Boys. Autism in A-U-T-I-S-M, sung over the Backstreet Boys, Larger Than Life. And his Spanish skills in the Ricky Martin adaptation, La Cocina and La Casa de Casanova. <laughs> Later that year, Chris wrote another poem, Sonichu's Ode to Rose Chu, an attempt at depicting the romantic ties binding Sonichu and Rose Chu. Oh Rose Chu, you are as beautiful as a rose, though a zap bud is the flower that heals your woes. He once again reinstates his idealized views on relationships between men and women. If I evolve into your knight, I will protect you with my lance. Speed makes no difference. Though you are slower than I, you dance in the field with such grace and style. Sigh. The poem closes with possibly the first utterance of a variant of Christian's commonly used term, sweetheart. Rosie, as often as birds tweet, will you be my lovely heart sweet? In October of 2003, Christian reunited with his childhood friend, Sarah, for her birthday. For the special occasion, he made her a present, a hand-drawn comic book detailing the complete history of their life together, entitled, Chris Plus Sarah's Life Shares. It is from this work of literature that the majority of their interactions with each other has come to be known, including Sarah's supposed childhood bullying, which then 21-year-old Chris completely neglects. Like most of his creative attempts, it is self-centered, bragging about his accomplishments concerning Sonichu. He also talks about her personal life, including her relationship with her boyfriend. As of some time before July 2000, Sarah has been living with her boyfriend, Wes Isley, a magician who does parties. He closes the book with hope for the future. A special note from Christian to Sarah, I hope that we can hang together sometime, but for now and forever, we will always be good friends. To return the sentiment, Sarah decided to spend Christmas with the Chandlers, which delighted Chris. Nintendo On November 22, 2003, 
Christian filmed a documentary of his activities in the game Animal Crossing on the Nintendo GameCube, which he then sent to Nintendo for consideration. Chris narrates this hour-long tour of two of his self-made towns, Quickville and Quick City. Since the documentary features a video game player narrating his activities while playing a game, this possibly makes Chris the first ever Let's Player in the modern understanding of the word. I love Nintendo! Welcome to my Animal Crossing for Nintendo GameCube. I am your host. My name is Christian Weston Chandler. I live in Rutgersville, Virginia. And I is 21 years old. And I play because I'm young at heart. So anyway, we're going to take a tour of my city. Like everything he produces, it includes Sonichu. So anyway, stepping out is my character, Sonichu. He's wearing the clothes with the character on it. Like I said, you might remember his face. And there's his actual face. You remember the rest of his body, you see the whole picture. Chris performs a spontaneous rendition of Yellow is a Mellow Color off the Sonic and the Hedgehog Boys album. Yellow is a mellow color, yes it is, it's a mellow color. Sonic you zaps the lightning, and mellow color. Yeah. He also treats the audience with a performance of So Need a Cute Girl. Tell me why I'm stuck as a virgin with rage. Tell me why I so need a cute girl my age. Tell me why I ain't never wanna hear you say I have a boyfriend. And that was inspired by a real thing. He previews the in-game diary that he keeps. As for a monthly journal entry here in November, yeah, I try to get a girlfriend because I don't have a girlfriend. But I have made up a poem. Let you guys read it. Alright. Scroll down a little bit as we go along. It's a very good poem because I am an artist as well as a poet. I make a rhyme every time. He proceeds to give a tour of his bedroom. This is my bedroom. It's a lot of fun, isn't it? Because I like to make things fun since you know I'm young at heart. As he unwittingly transfers his hoarding habits into a virtual environment, his bedroom in Animal Crossing closely replicates his real-life counterpart. Chris goes outside and comes across several characters who all seem to run back indoors at the very side of him. Around here, I want to show you my favorite character that I kind of got to know from the start. Oop, she just went in. There's Anna Cootie. She just went in. There's Elmer. He just went in. He then travels to his house on Quickville Island to reveal that he mostly uses the property for extra storage. I use mine as storage for the uh, extra items I uh, don't have room for at home. Yeah, I got a bunch. He reasserts his brand loyalty for Nintendo and decries their competitors. Speaking of which, you should make Sonic Heroes should be Nintendo GameCube exclusive because Xbox and PlayStation 2, my opinion is the same as yours, they both stink. Yeah, I do not even own them. I don't even want them. That goes double for the PS1 as well. But if you want to know my game systems, I had my GameCube for about almost a year and a half now. Got it on May 31st, 2002. I got your SNES, Nintendo 64, NES. I got the Genesis 301 with the original Genesis, 32X, and Sega CD, as well as Sega Dreamcast, and the Sega Saturn. So I got mostly all of them. I've been a Sonic fan forever, and that's why I'm glad that Sonic came to uh, Nintendo. He mentions that he likes to keep his surroundings clean by picking weeds. Oh, we look at this. There's a weed. I pick weeds. Keeps my town clean as well as uh, quick sea. He also likes to keep active. Another weed. Why do you know about that? I usually like to run. It, keep, it keeps me going faster. He introduces the viewers to his character, Crystal. Anyway, uh... This is Crystal. She's wearing the uh, rose chew look. There's a zap button on the door. I got Sanchi's rose chew mug right here. Near the end, Chris proclaims that he is high functioning autistic. And uh, to answer the all important question What is the meaning of HFA with the two red eyes? I will tell you. Got that? That means high functionally autism because that's what I am. I'm high functionally autistic. I may have autism, but since I'm high functional, I do all, I can do a lot of things. I mean, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do this documentary I'm doing right now. But anyway, uh, for the for the submission of Nintendo Power, 
This has been a documentary narrated by Christian Weston Chandler. Thank you very much, and I hope that you will consider this for a publication. Bye now. Christian started 2004 with a New Year's resolution to find a girlfriend. On January 3rd, he drew a Sonichu comic strip, which also featured Rose Chu and Black Sonichu. This was the first time he included his characters in an illustrated storytelling setting. On the 6th, he went to get an eye exam. The optometrist in question happened to be Dr. David Chandler, Chris's brother from Bob's first marriage, who informed him for the first time that he had an 8-year-old niece named Savannah. On January 18th, he wrote Hard Love Quest, a poem concerning his difficulties in finding a boyfriend-free girl. Without girlfriend love, he feels an older age, as he is still stuck as a virgin with rage. He searched low and high to the end. The only delay is the fear of being already beaten by a boyfriend. On January 31st, Christian wrote in his diary, Well, it's the end of another month, and I still don't have a girlfriend. Maybe my latest idea, the Sonichu's News Dash newsletter, will make the ladies take notice of me. The newsletter in question was an outlet for Christian's creative ideas concerning Sonichu and his poetry. Issue 1 featured a couple of skits starring Sonichu, the poem Saddest Heart in the World, and a personal ad for himself, which was not unlike his attraction sign. Christian is a very shy and very thoughtful person and will only accept person-to-person -person encounters. When getting his attention, approach and say hi to him. Do not flirt from a distance. He will not be able to notice. To find Christian, he'll be wearing the Sonichu medallion. In addition to posting a digital copy onto his website, he distributed printed copies of the newsletter around PVCC campus as an alternative to his attraction sign. This must have caught the attention of Mary Lee Walsh, who issued a cease and desist order. In an email dated February 1st, Chris tried to settle out of court. Mary, I've slept on it, and I've realized that note hanging is not the way to get attention, and I don't really want to meet with either you nor Susan. No offense. I'll tell you what, let's forget the meeting, and if you will allow my newsletter to stay in distribution, I will do all of the following. I will never hang notes on the wall again. I'll consider stopping my silent treatment on Susan. I'll consider knocking you and Susan up my scale of respect each by two points. Zero equals no respect. Ten equals respect. Walsh replied and insisted that they meet the following week. On February 9th, Christian recounted the events of that meeting. Mary Lee Walsh made it illegal to distribute the news dash. I am very angry at that XXXXX. In response, I plan to incite the masses and hope they demand the return of the news dash so my chances on getting a girlfriend can be restored. I have also declared war on them as well. It was allegedly during this meeting where he performed his curse yehameha attack which consisted of Chris mimicking the hand motion of an attack move from the anime series Dragon Ball Z and cursing people into experiencing bad luck. However, it is not certain whether he was inspired by the original occurrence of the Kamehameha or its parody featured in another anime, Excel Saga, to which Chris has definitely been exposed. In March, Chris claimed that the kerfuffle concerning Walsh got his parents upset too. That XXXXX Mary Lee Walsh got on my and my parents' nerves. All I'd been doing was trying to get a girlfriend. Is that too much to ask? I am very devastated due to my shattered heart that XXXXX caused unto me. My life sucks. Completely disregarding her demands, he published issue 3 of Sonichu's News Dash, with most of the content themes remaining unaltered. However, his requirements for a boyfriend-free girl were tweaked a little bit. He was now looking for 18 to 22 year olds since he had just turned 22 himself. In May of 2004, Nintendo Power magazine published an article highlighting Christian's Animal Crossing video referring to Chris only as Sonichu. Simply amazing. There's no other way to describe what we've received from Sonichu of Quickville, a full video documentary that walked us through his daily life. His opulent manor contained every manner of furniture. 
Quickville's landscape was filled to the bursting point with all the animals who'd moved to his well-tended town. And Sonichu has customized everything about his town. Even many villagers have followed his bold trends, wearing the patterns he has created. This apparently got the attention of PBCC's newspaper, The Forum, which featured Christian and Sonichu in an exclusive report. PBCC student Christian Chandler has dedicated many hours to his pastime. He is the creator of Sonichu, the electric hedgehog Pokemon. Like Sonic, Sonichu can run at high speeds. During Super Sonic's battle against the perfect chaos monster, Sonic Adventure DX for GameCube, Super Sonic was spat out by the monster and collided with a bystanding Pikachu, Chandler explained. According to the story, the power from the Chaos Emeralds transformed Pikachu into Sonichu. Chandler and the world he created for Sonichu were featured in the May 2004 issue of Nintendo Power. The place is called Quickville. The quick prefix are his initials, Christian Weston Chandler. Nintendo Power was apparently impressed with Chandler's work. During all this rigmarole, he continued to publish his news dash, but he updated his personal contact information to include a link to his Match.com profile, which he created to aid in his love quest. It was also around this time that he opened a MySpace account. I enjoy drawing, listening to music, playing video games, and TCG. I also like anime, Legos, and I love my parents. I also enjoy web design. He proceeds to list all the gaming consoles in his possession, finishing with the Pokemon catchphrase, Gotta catch them all. Interestingly, he listed his occupation as student slash cartoonist. He explores his most desperate desires in his blurb. I am a bit shy, but I would enjoy the company of a beautiful girl who likes some of the things I do. I also like to have fun when I can, and I don't really like to be alone. I graduated from high school on the honor roll, and I'm doing very well at PVCC. A lot of men make false promises to their girlfriends, but I am totally different. When it comes to what I can offer, I can seriously promise care, respect, empathy, and love. I think that most girls deserve the world, and I would do my best to give it to them. In May 2004, he attended the anime Mid-Atlantic Convention for the first time, where he met notable voice actress Monica Rial. She also sings opera very nicely, and she is a very nice, fun, and sweet person to hang around with. She sure made my day a sweet one. In Sonichu's News Dash, Issue 5, he introduces three new Sonichu characters. Christian Sonichu, based on himself, Wesley Sonichu, his quote-unquote rival, who's based on Sarah Hammer's boyfriend, Wes Isley, and Sarah Hammer Rose Chu, obviously named after Sarah herself. In June, to celebrate the 24-year wedding anniversary of his parents, Chris made them a present, a dramatic retelling of the family's life via Animal Crossing. Through this videographic endeavor, he delves deep into the family's history. Hi, Mom and Dad. How are you doing? This my little present for y'all. A little... about how y'all were and how you are now and so forth. So take a trip back in time with me, won't you? As we explore uh, how each of you were. And of course, first we'll travel back in time to the time of good old Robert Franklin Chandler Jr. He was a hip youngster back in his day. Let's take a look inside his chateau and uh, see what describes him as him. He collects records. He's got lots of them. He's got so many ships. He likes call a record case. Yeah. Chris reveals that Bob has Cherokee ancestry. He was born in Cherokee in uh, Texas. Actually, he was, he was like 116th Cherokee. But that's why we have this totem pole here. This Chinese lion here. That's, uh, he was, he's been to Korea. For uh, war, World War II, I believe it was. They got conduct medal of honor. That's what this is right here. He performs the same type of tour for Barbara. But back then she went to school and she worked hard. And see this uh, shirt here? That's her school colors, blue and white. Because uh, back in high school, she was a cheerleader. Bum bum, sis boom ba, yay yay, la la la. 
Oh yeah, she likes the old stuff, get old stuff as well, so she's got a little tea set here. And uh, we got a kitchen, fridge, and a uh, stove. Here's a little fan to keep cool with. Keep food in this little uh, pantry. And she keeps her uh, boots and mops in the old closet here. Although somebody brought the mop, somebody wanted to clean up. You put your garbage in the garbage can. And this is the sad part. And they get in some in some places now in the uh, very few houses nowadays, but what happened in the uh, old days? The bathroom was in the same room as uh, the kitchen. But luckily, we always remember to wash our hands with soap and water. Yeah. Anyway, that's just in the days of old. Nowadays, she does have a private bathroom. Yeah. Chris explains how his parents first met. They met over at Maddie's pub, see. Yeah. Mom was just uh, sitting down with her friend. She was watching uh, Bobby yet sing up here. And well, she liked, she really liked his uh, singing. So uh, she, as father put it, she went up to him and then uh, as he passed by, changed the, changed the thermo, thermostat. Yeah. Anyway, she chased him down the hallway and cornered him. And then uh, after that, they just talked. Like, they just uh, talked things out and they, they got to know each other. Not common things. Bob, do you take this woman to be your lovely wed wife to love and hold and cherish and to honor? I do. And do you, Barbara, take this man to be your lovely wed husband to love and cherish and to honor forever? I do. I now pronounce you man and wife, you may kiss the bride. Whoopee! After reenacting their wedding, Christian introduces himself into the picture. But anyway, when first comes love, then comes marriage. Then they come along with their baby carriage, and that's where I came in. Born in February 1918 with me. He gives himself a tour of his own room. So anyway, this is my bedroom. And then returns to Bob's room. As a little retribution for uh, how things were, we're going to play a little number on the jukebox here. But since we don't have side-by-side -side on recording, we're, we're going to play uh, Sitting Under the Apple Tree. <laughs> He proceeds to let the 1942 song Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree play in full. And there you have a nice little classic test. And now for uh, my mom and dad, we'll play something special for this uh, video. This is my way of saying happy anniversary to y'all. Coming up more. The video cuts to a drawing made with Mario Paint, which says, To Mom and Dad, Happy Anniversary. Thank you both for my birth. Love, Christian C. In July, Chris began going to the Charlottesville Fashion Square, attraction sign in hand, to seek out fellow mates. Evidently, his current practice did not yield promising results, as in a diary entry dated August 1st, he announced, well, it's another month. Still no girlfriend. But I have a new idea that I'm sure will reel in a girlfriend on a fateful red string. The idea concerning red string consisted of Christian tying a red string to a paper heart on which pick me up and bring me to my owner was written. The significance of using a red string was most likely a reference to its appearance in the anime Excel Saga and is a well-known symbol in many Asian cultures. Christian would throw the heart at prospective partners and hope that they would pick up the heart and follow the red string leading back to him. It cannot be determined how successful this strategy could have been, because just four days after he employed the red string of fate, a mall security guard, which Chris referred to as a jerk op, put an end to it. In August, Chris shifted focus away from Pokemon and centered his attention on Yu-Gi-Oh, a similarly themed card game. He began making his own custom cards and attended his first Yu-Gi-Oh tournament at the game place where he met Megan Schroeder. Over the months of getting to know Megan, I grew fond of her. Although at that time, and up to now, she wasn't interested in a lovely relationship. I've bided to her wishes and requests. I am truly fond of her. Since he and Megan had Yu-Gi-Oh as a common interest, Christian only intensified his obsession with the game creating more and more custom Yu-Gi-Oh cards, with one depicting Crystal, Christian's make-believe female twin. 
He also designed a girlfriend's gift card on which the illustrative girlfriend looks suspiciously like the sister. On September 4th, Christian reflected on his love quest so far. While I was at the mall for the eighth week today, I realized something. Since I have been using a sign to state my being single and lonesome towards an 18 to 22 year old boyfriend free woman, I, in the event, was trying to sell myself like a new car. Two days later, Chris's love quest was interrupted by a jerk cop. I told that jerk cop off when I pulled some of my fun cards and told my lonesome virgin story, intimidated him, and shouted no into his face. In short, today was my independence day, but I am still alone. On September 11th, his search for love took a turn for the worst. I was not bothering anyone at the mall today while I was trying to sell myself. When I got arrested for trying, I fortunately did not go to jail, but I have been stripped of my right to go to the mall by myself. I would be required to bring my mom or dad with me. My independence and my soul were practically murdered. Chris's run of misfortune climaxed when only five days later, the school board of PVCC suspended him for one year. My dad is bloodthirsty for revenge as well. He's going to write to US President George W. Bush Jr. and Laura Bush to help me get allowed back to PVCC. We all curse to death upon that XXXXX Mary Lee Walsh. In conjunction with his suspension, he was required to take anger management classes, get a psychological evaluation, and receive social skills counseling. Ten days after the event, he lamented over his inability to go to PVCC or the mall, and confessed that he would be asking for a girlfriend this Christmas. Despite his bans from the college and the fashion square, he decided to continue with his search for a boyfriend-free girl, but relocated to the University of Virginia's campus to do so. However, this move wasn't for long, as Christian was allowed back to the fashion square in November. Regardless, he went back to UVA for a different kind of engagement, in the form of a mandatory psychiatric evaluation. There are more of such documented examinations in existence, but this is the only one so far which has been made public. Mr. Chandler says that since finishing high school and starting at PVCC in the year 2000, he has had an increasing interest in a female companion. His attempts at this ultimately led to his suspension from college. His attempt took the form of a sign which he placed next to himself while sitting in the lobby at Piedmont. This sign was a list of qualifications that a potential girlfriend would have. He said that he has been very frustrated by his inability to find a girlfriend, and he suffers from noviophobia. This refers to his frustration that females often tell him that they already have a boyfriend. While he does have physical attraction towards females, his primary frustration is with his lack of companionship. The report mentions his medical record and earlier evaluations. He has already undergone psychological evaluation by Robin Hawks at the Center of Learning Potential. The recommendation concerning Mr. Chandler's emotional status is that he seek psychiatric and psychological treatment. The psychologist felt that counseling and medication would possibly address his obsessive thought pattern and assist him with social skills. She also recommended anger management training. The analysis also comments on Christian's appearance and demeanor in the session. The patient is a mildly overweight white male, wearing blue jeans and a shirt. He was also wearing a makeshift necklace that has a large plastic medallion in the shape of a Pokemon character's head. He also had a number of Shrinky Dink decorations attached to this necklace. He had a large backpack that he carried with him, and had a notebook containing a large number of drawings. His speech was somewhat nasal, with frequent awkward laughing during his sentences. His speech was fluent. His responses were appropriate to the questions posed to him. Overall, the volume of his speech was slightly elevated, although his tone was generally pleasant and almost jovial. His thought processes were linear and logical. He was somewhat concrete, especially regarding social interactions. He seemed to have a good insight into his limitations. The attending physician offers up his final verdict. Folstein's score was 30 out of 30, with his sentence being, Uncle Spunky is a really funky monkey. Mr. Chandler is a 22-year-old man with a history of developmental delays and autism. Despite these limitations, he seems to have been quite successful in maximizing his academic abilities. He is left, however, with a severe degree of social awkwardness and seems to have good insight into this. He is left feeling somewhat frustrated as he has a strong desire for companionship. 
although his social limitations prevent him from being able to realize this in the way which he would like. The patient doesn't seem to pose a significant threat to himself or anyone else. After the evaluation, Chris carried on with life much like before, with neither him nor his parents making any significant effort to change his ways. But Christmas was soon approaching, and maybe Santa would bring him a girlfriend like he wished, who could right all his wrongs and change his life for the better. as fascinated. This is the story of Chris Chan. Hello, my name is uh, Christian Chandler age 22 at this time. I will be 23 on February 24th, 2005. <clears throat> anyway, for uh, over a year now, I've uh, been trying to attract an 18 to 22 year old boyfriend free girl, 18 to 21 before February 24th, 2004, which is this year. Anywho, I've been trying for over a year to attract a girl, boyfriend free girl, and I have failed. And you know, when you got when you got so much so many failures at this time, you can't help but feel sad, you know, and depressed. And yet here it is about Christmas time. And well, all I want for Christmas is a boyfriend free girl. Chris prepares for Christmas two thousand four by singing two of his songs for the camera. He performs So Need a Cute Girl. Tell me why. I so need a cute girl, my head. Followed by, All I Want for Christmas is a Pretty Girlfriend. All I want for Christmas is a girlfriend. Oh, she has to be 18 to 22. <sighs> well, at this time of year, all I can say right now is that I hope Santa will comply with my request and bring me a pretty girlfriend. And so, happy holidays. From me, Christian Chandler, by the way, you can call me Chris in public. And thank you. Christian whipped his camera out for Christmas Day, too, and documented the state of the house at that time. Twas Christmas Day, and all through the house, the creatures that were stirring were my family and me and our two cats. And we wander upon our wondrous Christmas tree. With a star that was made so delicately. Delicately? The star on top of the tree is in fact Sonichu. Chris reveals that his dreams were dashed that day. And a Christmas present that was supposed to be for the girlfriend that Santa brought. But unfortunately, she didn't show. Chris introduces his audience to his parents. And now we wander in on my family. Say hello, Father. Yeah. Making my Christmas movie. See, well, I'm going to play on to VHS anyway. All right. A smaller Christmas tree down here. Yeah. And our mothers sleep here in a dark area. Would you care to share a Merry Christmas with the world, Father? The tour puts a spotlight on the extent of the hoarding situation in the house, as Chris visibly has trouble navigating through the hoard. Can you say something to the entire world? Yep. After the tour, Chris documents the gift exchange, revealing the interpersonal dynamics of the family. Yeah, it's recorded. So, here we are around the Christmas tree. We're going to open presents. Right, right. Chris presents Bob with a card. I did. Supposed to read it? Yes, read it. Am I supposed to read it out loud? Yeah. Read, uh, read, to, read to Mom. I want to thank you all for your support and love throughout my fantastic... Uh, 
And if Santa doesn't bring me one, no Chris, no Tom. Like I asked him, then I'm going to need some support finding a fourth fence free. It'll come, Chris, and hope you all like my present. Okay. Today I'm thinking of Christmas and remembering you all. Merry Christmas, Christian C. Yep. Christian gives Bob the option of receiving the puppet TV show, Fraggle Rock, on DVD or on VHS. After Christian discreetly implies that he wants to keep the DVD for himself, Bob caves in and chooses to take the VHS. Yes. So you want the VHS? Yeah. There you go. I'm not much of a... Uh, DVD. Why do we have no I gave, him a cho- I gave him a choice, remember? You remember the original white DVD? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's trying to rock, Bob, that's what's on there. I see. Everything that's on the DVD is on that VHS. Uh, yeah, it just worked better than my system. Yeah. Chris presents Barbara with a Lego set. <laughs> Snowboarding stuff. He gives her a plush doll of the Japanese character Hamtaro. Look okay, at you, Hamtaro. That's cute. Yeah. That's cute. It's a Hamtaro. He's a little hamster. He's a little little hamster. The family discussed the possibility of a surprise visit from Sarah. Oh, that's my present for Sarah. Because, uh, you know, she, she might come over. Okay. Well, she did last year, remember? Chris attempts at an embrace with his mother, but ends up hurting her instead. Hmm. Here. Oops. I'm sorry. Don't work my head. I'm sorry. He does it again. Two boxes together here. I'm sorry. Chris gives Barb another present. A snow globe with him in it. Snow globe. With me in it. Merry Christmas, Robert. It's also got, it's also got side shoe in it. Look. See? You know, one side, side shoe on the other. That's cool. I got it over at Walmart. The snow globe. How about that? It's cool. Yeah, that's me. Merry Christmas. Yep, yeah, Merry Christmas. Now we'll do the back dance again for the wall. Snappy New Year. Yeah. Snappy New Year, huh? Not only count. Yep. After the gift unwrapping, Christian went back to his room to record a video recapping the events. Well, now this ends our family Christmas of 2004. I did get some nice gifts, but it does not compare to having a boyfriend free girl like a make it to a girlfriend. <sighs> uh, but unfortunately, I was hoping for her to come, but she didn't. My, my uh, lifelong friend, Sarah Hammer, You know, she had not been paired up with that jerk, Wes Isley. I could have her, but seriously, though, I wish she was here so that I could talk to her and so that she could help me in my quest to get a boyfriend free, 18, 20 year old girl. 18, 23, yes, of February 24th, 2005. Well, anyway, uh, that pretty much uh, sums up my uh, Christmas season for this year, so, uh, as he said, showbiz. Goodbye, folks. As he entered 2005, Christian continued his tried and true tradition of pacing around the mall, hoping to attract a boyfriend free girl. His activities quickly caught the eye of Anna McLaren, an employee of Pack and Son at Charlottesville Fashion Square, who described her encounter with him in a blog post titled The Tale of the Crazy Pacer. There was a guy who paced in front of Abercrombie and Fitch. He'd come and do it for hours on end just walking back and forth. He was an okay looking guy, not evil looking like creepy molester dude. So he would pace for his allotted time, then leave. Sometimes as he paced, he would sing or shout. Nobody really could ever tell what he was saying. Oh yeah, and he always wore the same shirt. A nice little long sleeved red and blue number that had a gold crest on the left side and white collar and cuffs. Then, one day, he decided to start pacing on the pack sun side so he started pacing in front of our store. We were doing floor set, and Lin Lin noticed that Crazy Pacer kept looking into Pac's son as he paced. And this day, he was acting particularly crazy. He'd pace and pace, then stop and shout something at the wall, then keep pacing. And he also did some singing, even getting into the vibrato falsetto junks. 
It was hilarious. So anyways, someone, 